now we're moving on to our Q&A questions and answers. Um, we already have a, quite a few questions lined up, but for our audience who are tuning in, if you would like to ask a question, please uh, make your question very brief and type it in to our chat box. Um, and we will uh, get to some of the questions over there as well. Um, our first question um, goes to Mr. Dima and Dr. Ellis. Um, some of the countries um, are outlining responsibilities of different institutions, ranging from intelligence uh, to social and health services in determining whether there is evidence to prosecute returnees and access um, and assess the risk of uh, uh, the type of risk that they may uh, pose. This information is then used to determine the best course of action. For instance, whether an individual is prosecuted, sending uh, or sent to counseling um, or a combination of both uh, or any of the or any other outcome. Um, so the question is, what are some opportunities or obstacles to such a model? Uh, thank you, I'm happy to, to jump in or Mr. Dima, if you'd like to. Okay. Um, so thank you for the question. I think from where I come from, from a health and human services sector, I think it's really critical that we have clarity around information flows. Um, the point of a multidisciplinary services team is not around information gathering to determine um, criminal responsibility. Um, and that I think it's critical that we keep a really clear line between any information gathering around criminal justice, criminal responsibility and prosecution separate from what do we need to know about an individual to understand their strengths, their needs, and how we can best implement supportive services to give them the best chance at moving forward in a healthy and productive way moving um, as, as they repatriate. So um, the teams that I have been involved in, we've had very clear uh, limitations around how information from a social services team can be shared. Um, the only context in which um, there would be crossover towards enforcement would be in the case of imminent risk, in which case we would be invoking the usual kind of emergency services, police or uh, mental health services needed to manage a, a safety situation of a client. But we in no way want to use that position to provide information for prosecution because I think it can really undermine trust in those services. And once we've done that, we've lost any opportunity we have to do good with those services. So that's that's where I come from. I don't know, Mr. Dima, if you have a, another perspective or want to share from a more practical uh, vantage point of what you're doing. No, I thank you. Thank you for the question. I uh, totally agree with you, Ms. Ellis. Uh, but of course, so we are a different, a little bit different perspective because we are a prosecution and we are a little bit more strict, you know. We have the, the law and we should respect the rules there. But of course, speaking uh, from this case that I already presented in my speech, uh, from the very first day, uh, the cooperation between institutions inside the country was very, very good. As I mentioned before, at the beginning, we adopted 72 hour emergency plan. And during this emergency plan, uh, we had a, a quite big number of institutions involved. Not only the Ministry of the Justice, not only the uh, prosecution office, but psychologists, sociologists, and all other uh, uh, parties that should be involved in the treatment of, of the repatriated, uh, repatriated citizens in our country. And this, because as I, said before, we had to do not only with four FTF fighters, 32 women, 74 children, majority of them under seven. So during the procedure, during the, procedure, the investigation procedure, during the interrogation of this uh, woman uh, on the interrogation process, uh, except the police officer, the, the prosecutor, all the time was present, the psychologist and sociologist. So, so starting from the interrogation, and continuing today still, care, take care about them, uh, try to reintegrate them in the society in the proper way. Of course, the punishment is two years only. For some, some, for some people, this punishment was, this sentence was uh, not enough. Hmm? For, but uh, again, 
was kind of agreement between us in the country. So it's not the, you can not be effective only with the sentence. You should work with them, should try to reintegrate them into society and to re-educate the children. So this is this for me. Thank you very much. Um, moving on to question number two, and this is uh, for uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Gudak and uh, Mr. Unspruisi. Uh, um, so the question is, there seems to be a, a contradiction in perception over rep uh, repatriation. Um, some European countries have made the case that they will only consider uh, responsible um, repatriation of their citizens, namely on a case-by-case -case basis. They also want to ensure that there, there is enough evidence to prosecute in the event of possible um, repatriation. On the other hand, uh, the counter argument often made is that the longer they stay in Syria or Iraq and are not repatriated, the more difficult it will be to collect data and answer for potential crimes upon return. So how, what is the best method to go with this sort of scenario? Okay. Um, there is, uh, uh, in France, they try to make uh, an assessment, assessment case uh, by case, okay? No. Uh, then uh, they do not want, like Belgium, like the UK, uh, uh, political authorities do, uh, do not want the coming back, uh, the repatriation. Then uh, you have the problem, uh, if you want to prosecute, the, the idea is that those guys must be sentenced in, in Iraq or in uh, Syria. If we want to prosecute them in France, and we, we will have, because we have two or 300 people in this situation, uh, the gathering of evidence is a problem, but as I told you, the, the access of evidence in France for, in a criminal case is very easy. And because the general trend of the, of the criminal prosecution is to get a sentence, I think that we will not have that many problems to get sentence against those guys, uh, even if there is, obviously speaking, a problem of gathering the evidence. But there is no a problem of admissibility of evidence. So we are starting a very long fight, to my, uh, in my opinion. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. Mm. Okay. It seems to me that the, this question relates to the overarching issue of sufficiency of evidence for prosecution and conviction, which, as my colleague just indicated, certainly, as several colleagues have indicated, can vary from country to country. I, I would also ask, how is responsible repatriation being defined, getting back to my, my constant <laughs> emphasis on definitions, if responsible repatriation means that any particular country is only willing to bring back its citizens against whom there was never any evidence whatsoever, and they probably never should have been taken into custody and detained for any period of time. That's easy, but once again, what do you do with all of the others? As far as bringing people back for trial in their own countries, uh, or under circumstances of having been convicted before some international tribunal or commission or international court, to what degree is that country going to grant comity, the legal word C-O-M-I-T-Y, which means honoring that foreign court's decision? And to what degree are these people going to have a separate and independent right to appeal in the courts of their own countries an adverse conviction against them? These are all the legal issues that get wrapped up. And it makes it, on the one hand, essential that they be addressed, these detainees be addressed on an individual case-by-case -case basis. It also makes it very difficult for a country to bring in people en masse, to bring in a large group of their own citizens back to that country and address that. And even if someone did have a significant amount of evidence against them, 
and they are to be brought back, is that only going to be done responsibly if someone such as Dr. Ellis or her colleagues have spent time with them and they've determined that this is an individual who can be successfully repatriated into their home country society? These are all the issues that, that I think make this incredibly complex and, and very difficult. You see, may I say, may I say, uh, say something? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Hello. The, the legal issues in France are rather clear. Okay. First point, any French citizen who commits an offense outside of France uh, remains under French criminal jurisdiction and can be judged before a French court. No problem about that. Second point, any kind of defendant in France, terrorist or common crime, common crime perpetrators, has a right to appeal. And this right to appeal is, not, is a right to appeal even on the merits and on the grounds of the conviction. So we do not have such, such problem. But however, like before any criminal court, we have a problem of gathering the, the evidence. I might add that the, the most common prosecution are a criminal conspiracy, which is in, in the French criminal law, not that complicated to establish because you only need some preparatory act in the view, in, with the view of commit a, terrorism, a terrorist action. But if you can gather some evidence of uh, simply and mere preparatory acts, this is enough to get, to get a sentence. Voilà. Absolutely, thank you so much. Um, and now we're going to take a um, um, uh, question um, for for Mike uh, for Mike Duffin. Um, can can you tell us more about the international visitors program or any other State Department sponsored program uh, that connects practitioners uh, and best practices uh, on 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 the prosecution and uh, repatriation uh, and uh, of R and R issues. Thanks, Mohammed. Um, as we've discussed over the past hour or so, this is a challenging issue. And while there have been examples of rehabilitation, reintegration from uh, conflicts in other regions, um, in a lot of uh, respects, uh, the, the challenges that these kids, um, our family members, and others ha are facing are uh, unique to that situation. Um, and so what we've tried to do is, uh, through exchange programs, it's connect people to people, expert to expert. And some of the people that we relied on early on, um, uh, over a year ago, Dr. Heidi Ellison, Dr. Stephen Wine from the University of Illinois, Chicago, those are people that we had um, connected with international delegations, both bringing people to their um, uh, universities and sending them overseas. We had been doing this for quite a long time. Uh, and then uh, when uh, the first country uh, that um, repatriated a sig significant number of people, Kazakhstan, uh, they brought back about 600 people about a year and a half ago, uh, we were able to send out Dr. Um, Dr. Wine and then we've sent out Dr. Ellis uh, to multiple countries. And so, um, I, I would just say that this is a, a complex issue and we've been trying to, in the case of Dr. Ellis with her work with um, the, uh, the, the, the Somali youth, uh, the refugees uh, that resettled in the United States, her work, um, you know, and, and I think, you know, she's touched on this bef multiple times before, but um, how, um, you know, there may be differences, but there's a lot of knowledge that she had that once she met other practitioners, um, she recognized how to adjust, um, you know, approaches or, or whatnot. And so it's just to say that uh, we need psychologists, social workers, um, religious leaders, and others talking to each other uh, to understand the challenges that uh, these individuals face and, you know, not have people uh, say, uh, how can I say, um, people who have, uh, experiences working with kids uh, who have experienced trauma, you know, from, 
either gangs or domestic violence, that's relevant experience, but it doesn't transfer exactly over. And it takes a little bit of time for people to calibrate their knowledge and experience. So, um, you know, obviously travel has come to a, a halt mostly with, with the pandemic, but, you know, with virtual programs, um, you know, this could really set the ground for engagement uh, longer term. And uh, that's one of the things that, um, you know, with Dr. Wine and Dr. Ellis that, you know, by initial engagements, we're, we're able to um, see, you know, what interests there are with international counterparts in sharing uh, best practices with others. And in the case of Kazakhstan, um, they traditionally were not a country that was very open to this type of engagement um, outside of, uh, you know, their region. And so, uh, for them to embrace uh, bringing back people and their rehabilitation reintegration program. They uh, literally and figuratively opened the door for international experts in other countries to um, uh, start a discussion about what they're doing. Um, and we've seen how, as I mentioned, Kazakhstan has been uh, a big help for Kyrgyzstan, who's looking to bring back uh, some of their uh, kids from Iraq. Um, but then, then they've also talked to other countries around the world, and it's really, um, it's those type of discussions that are important. And as you know, you, you, you alluded to before, going to Germany for prevention programs, uh, I would just stress that it's important that um, uh, while these women and children and uh, uh, adult males do need some type of psychosocial help in the short term, realistically, um, uh, they may not be going to psychologists, psychiatrists uh, for 10 years. And so ultimately, when we've moved on to another challenge, uh, uh, it's important to have prevention programs in place. And so um, how do you, whether you're in San Diego or uh, in Kosovo or elsewhere, how do you start a prevention program, a long-term sustainable prevention program? And so we've seen with programs, like I mentioned, strong cities and the mother school program in North Macedonia, it's really helped um, that national government there uh, develop a comprehensive plan so that, as I said before, um, if an individual, and we presume that the kids are innocent, but if something, uh, if they have some issues down the road, uh, there will be a community group that will help them uh, instead of them running into trouble, which would be unfortunate, but that does run there are a lot of parallels to the work that Dr. Ellis, the study that she did um, uh, on the, the, the Somali refugee community in the US. Yeah, absolutely, thank you. And um, a few more other interesting questions uh, for Dr. Ellis coming up as well. Uh, but this uh, next question goes to uh, everyone on the panel uh, uh, who would like to answer, and it, 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 it pertains to foreign fighters. Um, so when individuals are repa uh, repatriated, uh, what mechanisms are in place, if any, to ensure individuals are not returning to the battlefield or are looking to carry out attacks in the homeland? And this question, there's no particular person, so we could, we could go to anyone. Dominic, go ahead, Dominic. I see you raise your hand. Dominic, please. No, the, the, the answer in France, but I think it is the same in all the Western countries. Uh, the guy is arriving at the airport. He is uh, with the two French police officers coming from Turkey, okay? And he goes straight to the prosecutor desk, okay? Or he goes straight to the police station and he is remanded on, on custody for interrogation. Then he meets an examining judge who charged him with the offense and he is sent to another judge called the, the Juge de Liberté, Detention and Liberty Judge, who decides or not to remand him in, uh, in pretrial detention, which in practice he does each time because the guy is coming from a foreign countries, okay, and he is supposed to escape. And then uh, he starts the first. Uh, pre-trial detention time in France, we, uh, which is very, 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 very long uh, before getting a final uh, decision, because with the, the first degree and the second degree court of appeal and all the possible recourses, the pre-trial detention 
before a sentence is final can be very long, several years. And during that time, he is waiting in jail, okay? Being visited by his favorite lawyers, okay? Who arrive at the jailhouse in, uh, at eight in the morning to visit him for long years. Well, the way it is. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, so moving on to our uh, next question. This goes to Mr. Um, Artie. So um, the U.S. has repatriated and successfully prosecuted a number of returnees, including those involved with ISIS, uh, but who have not managed to travel uh, to Syria or Iraq. Um, with regards to women specifically, just because women terrorists contribute, uh, you know, contributions fall outside of the traditional uh, conceptions of terrorist activities, does it mean that they can be prosecuted under existing U.S. laws or statutes? Thank you, Mohammed. I appreciate that. Um, so, in the United, in the context of the United States specifically, uh, certain material support statutes sanction a provision of any material support to a foreign terrorist organization. So, the statutes basically. Uh, specifically refer to terrorist organization and sanction any involvement with a terrorist organization as opposed to terrorist activity itself. So such statutes, and I don't want to go into the numbers, but 2239B specifically has been effectively used uh, to prosecute the more generalized, so to speak, support that women provide to terrorist organizations, including in the case of ISIS. Uh, the most recent example that I could think of is uh, the recent American woman charged with conspiracy to provide material support to ISIS and in aiding and abating individuals in provide, providing material support to ISIS. So the last time we heard about the case, the prosecutors have sought about, uh, have sought 10 years of uh, prison sentence in this specific case. Um, if we look at the social media uh, postings that often serve to recruit new followers or incite into violence, whether it's in Syria or abroad, as evidence in some uh, cases here in the United States, such postings would qualify under material support statute and potentially lead to prosecution under these existing statutes. Uh, however, uh, there are also instances where we see of social media communications or content that wouldn't necessarily fall within the confines of material support statutes that is prescribed by these, uh, by these specific statutes. For example, if uh, uh, an individual engages in daily descriptions of the life in caliphate would, would likely fall outside the bounds of this statute. Uh, uh, even the instances of, let's say, clarifying life inside ISIS, uh, in some cases, would, uh, would, not, uh, would not classify as a necessarily offense under the statute. So the potential issues that we have seen here in the States um, with charging women with the provision of the material support in the context of social media posts lies in the difficulties of determining agencies. So basically, if women were the ones who voluntarily posted such posts online or were coerced to do by, by their men, for example, in Syria. The third uh, thing that comes to mind is the, the examples of the women who may be charged for providing material support in the form of personnel of themselves, such as serving in all women Al Hansa Brigade, a notorious all women brigade uh, under ISIS. Provided there was uh, there is uh, evidence to, uh, uh, to to show involvement with Al Hansa Brigade, uh, this it, this could be easier to provide uh, an easier avenue for prosecution, considering women had. Uh, basically operated under the direction, direct direction of ISIS as opposed to independently of it. So these are three scenarios that kind of come to mind. And then uh, that we have, uh, again, a legal expert would argue that in the States that providing such material support uh, to or service or personnel to ISIS, uh, whether in social media context or serving in al Qaeda Brigade, as I said, would be a clear violation of uh, specific material support statute and, and possibly grounds for prosecution. I don't know, maybe uh, John could uh, fill us in with, uh, with this question as well. Thank you, Artie. And uh, in, in, deference, in deference to the time we have or don't have, I, I just want to say that I think that this situation with the U.S. is deserving of a significant amount of scrutiny from both an evidentiary perspective and a constitutional perspective. It seems that the statute, particularly the one that you're citing, really is little more than an association law 
which gets us back to the Scales versus United States Supreme Court ruling in 1961 that said that in order for someone to be convicted of a criminal offense, really for little more than associating with any organization, there has to be evidence of active membership and specific intent. There's also a First Amendment question as to whether these females, the women who have been arrested in the United States, often for buying a plane ticket and going to the airport, whether they have uh, a freedom of religion argument that isn't being respected, or really merely wanting to associate themselves romantically or otherwise with a man with whom they share a certain religious perspective or ideology. And to the extent these women are availing themselves to people who are accused of being criminals, of violating the US criminal code, how different is that from the plethora, the large number of women we have here in the United States who regularly go out of their way to establish relationships with men serving time in prison and to even go to the extent of marrying them. So I, I think there are another, a number of issues which really haven't made it up to the courts to be subjected to that level of legal scrutiny from a number of different perspectives. Thank you so much. Um, let's um, get to um, Heidi. So this is sort of like a twofold um, uh, question. Um, the first one is the key focus on rehabilitation and reintegration R and R programs seem to be on de-radicalization efforts, um, uh, especially on ideology and disowning or rejecting extremist ideology. Um, is such an approach effective? in your opinion? Um, that is the first question. Um, and the second question um, is effective R&R programs require uh, adequate uh, mental health, social service, and other resources. Uh, some countries lack qualified uh, psychiatrists, uh, social workers, and other R&R professionals to deal with trauma care. Um, in some cases, they lack uh, them altogether. Um, what can domestic and international partners uh, do to strengthen the capacity building um, of activities of such countries? So, um, and Mike Duffin, feel free to uh, chime in on the uh, second part of the question as well. Great, thank you. Um, thank you for those thoughtful questions. Uh, so my take is that you don't need to focus on ideology. Um, these are not de-radicalization programs. These are programs that seek to identify you know, what are some of the barriers to healthy development, what are some of the um, particular psychosocial challenges, needs um, that an individual might have, and how can you, um, how can you address those? And my, the way I think about it is that once you do that, once you've strengthened social connection with pro-social groups and individuals, once you've removed some of the um, some of the barriers to healthy development that might be um, raised by trauma exposure, once you've kind of thought about societal acceptance and stigma and how to mitigate that, that you've positioned someone to have many more options in terms of how they relate to society and where they see kind of their future, their goal orientation. I also think constructive civic engagement avenues can be very important to um, in, embed in some of the intervention plans for individuals. Um, there is also a role at times for uh, ideological mentorship, so maybe religious mentorship or, you know, some exposure to other ideas or other ways of thinking. The way I have thought about it, though, is that it's not a function of directly taking on ideological beliefs or trying to convince someone otherwise. It's more about complicating their world so there are more ways of thinking, more options, and more motivation to really make choices that are um, compatible with a uh, peaceful society. So that's my thought on number one. On number two, absolutely, it's, it's a great question. How do you implement some comprehensive psychosocial support program if as a larger country, there aren't um, sufficient resources or trained professionals? Um, what I would say to that is this is where taking a more socio-ecological lens is incredibly helpful. So if I had come on today and said what we really need is high level cognitive processing for traumatized individuals and intensive psychotherapy, that is a model that requires um, 
professionals with years and years of training to implement. But I don't think that's what we need. What we really need is a much more sort of thoughtful look at the layers of the social ecology and, and ask ourselves, you know, what, what are the barriers to a healthy life that an, in, this individual is encountering? And it might be that they need more school support. It might be that the parents need some, some jobs training and connection to, um, to a job so that they can have a more stable income. It could be that they, they need soccer teams and connections to social clubs. None of those things require a deep bench of trained mental health professionals. So there are some models that are really innovative and effective in um, place in, in various low and middle, middle income countries that involve pairing um, lay, lay people, pair professionals with someone who has some more in-depth training in mental health uh, treatment. Those can be very effective. Um, and I also think that there's quite a lot that can be done thinking more ecologically and about stressors and um, social connection that don't require that kind of expertise. And just to piggyback off of what Heidi has said, um, with the number of returnees, we know who these people are. Um, we're not um, working in the dark here. Um, and so when you look at any country, where did the foreign terrorist fighters and accompanying family members come from? Uh, w there, there's hard data on that. And um, I would just say long-term, it's not just the people who went to Syria and Iraq uh, who, or who came back from there. It's the people from those communities that um, thought about going uh, and um, you know, did not go either because they were too young. Um, it was harder to, to travel there after a certain point in time. And um, perhaps the people who went to Syria uh, in Iraq um, saw the, the, the evil doing of ISIS, um, even if they have sympathies, may not want to participate uh, uh, to support terrorism in the future. They, they've had enough, they want to move on with their lives. I'm not saying that would be true for everybody, definitely not. Um, but I would just be concerned with a newer generation that may not have uh, heard these horror stories. Uh, and it's important to, um, uh, to capture those voices, uh, those people who, uh, you know, when we talk about messaging or counter messaging, um, there are a lot of sto compelling stories about people who saw what ISIS really was up front and they rejected that ideology. And so, um, uh, you know, I don't know, I don't have a crystal ball, but, you know, how will uh, young, children, young people view ISIS um, five or 10 years from now? What, what, you know, will there be a, a follow-up organization that, um, you know, tries to uh, pick up where they left off? And so um, I would just say that we can uh, take nothing for granted, uh, but also, uh, like I said before, with uh, prevention, we're trying to cast the big net, whereas we know where these people are. Uh, but the challenge, as Heidi was uh, talking about, Dr. Ellis, um, in some places like Kosovo or North Macedonia, those are small countries where you can go from one end to the other in uh, you know, a half day, uh, a half day's drive or whatever, or a couple hours. Uh, with Kazakhstan, with um, over 600 returnees spread out over one of the largest land masses in the world. Um, you know, they have 17 different rehabilitation reintegration centers. Um, that's a challenge. And so I, I think the question is, how does any country or community tackle this issue when uh, any capital may have a large concentration of talented individuals who have relevant experience that could apply to the, this problem set? But um, uh, perhaps the, the radicalization recruitment um, to violence is not taking place in the capital city. And so how do you get that expertise? And um, certainly, um, uh, you know, whether it's global health or another issue, you don't necessarily need, uh, it's important to have trained professionals, but you also can have individuals who can do their role in terms of community health. Um, uh, but, and I, I would stress with the US government, uh, because of the First Amendment, the Establishment Clause, we're not trying to de-radicalize or get anybody to change their religious views. It's the, you know, the qualifying to violence or to terrorism, uh, you know, disengaging from those violent activities uh, that uh, is the focus of our efforts.
Thank you so much. And, and we're going to leave it with this very last question. Um, and this goes to uh, Dr. Uh, Heidi. Um, and if there's any other panelists who will also want to chime in, uh, feel free. Um, but it's often argued that um, pr prior exposure to ISIS extremist ideology, uh, trauma, um, coupled with you know, family issues, school-related issues, make children uh, uh, high risk for violent extremism in long term. Um, also, how can governments and um, PCBE practitioners mitigate uh, risks of violent extremism among children who live under ISIS uh, when not much is actually known about the uh, specific developmental pathways of such children? Um, so can governments and practitioners rely on the experiences of children who have been exposed uh, to trauma in other contexts? Um, or in other words, how, how similar uh, are the experiences of children who lived under ISIS compared to children, um, populations that were exposed to trauma in other places? Great, thank you. Um, yeah, this is a question that I've wondered as well, and actually in collaboration with Dr. Steve Wine, who you've heard mentioned here before, um, we sat down and did a thorough mapping of all the research of different groups of children who'd experienced adversity and what the research tells us about what are the, um, you know, what are the leverage points uh, for positive outcome with those kids? And so we were looking at former child soldiers, we were looking, we looked at gang involvement, we've looked at child abuse, we've looked at, you know, a whole range of different groups, refugee children, kids who, if you think about this unique population, all of these other groups that for which we have a much more uh, deep range of research intersect in some way with some of the challenges of this group. So no, we don't know what particular needs this group has and what specifically will help them. On the other hand, there's a wealth of knowledge about the various types of stressors and challenges and adversities that kids have experienced and what we need to do to promote healthy adjustment. And I don't think these kids are that different in part because child development unfolds in a fairly predictable way. Um, we know a lot about what works and what derails it. And we also know, um, I mean, these are, these are brain systems that are common across everybody. And there's quite a lot we can do then to pull from those um, research that's gone before. So I would point you towards that paper that we published, Steve Wine, W-E-I-N-E -E, is the lead author, um, Rehabilitation and Reintegration of Children. And, and I would just say that um, we don't know what's going to work. That's why we need to get in there with the best evidence base we have to implement an empirically informed program. And then we need to do really rigorous monitoring and evaluation so that we can be learning and improving as we go. We can't afford to do this piecemeal with kind of lack of coordination and communication between the different countries that are doing this. We need to be learning live time around how things are unfolding and how they're working. Um, and we need to draw on what's been done before. The alternative we know is not going to work. The alternative is to do nothing and, and look the other direction. So I think, you know, there's, there's no promises that pro programs would be effective in preventing violence among these kids, but I also think that there's very good reason to believe that we could do it, and especially if we can do monitoring and evaluation and iteratively improve our efforts as we go. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, well, everyone, uh, that's it for us uh, today. I want to thank uh, uh, everyone for joining our ACTRI Security Talks webinar series um, and a very special uh, shout out and thanks to our panel uh, uh, panelists today who shared their expertise, um, uh, their knowledge, and most importantly, uh, their time with us. Um, special shout outs also to Dave Leary, uh, who's our director of media and who's currently doing all the behind the scene work uh, to bring us uh, all the technological aspects to this um, webinar. Uh, shout outs to our ACTIR board uh, and all of our staff members. Uh, we wanna thank you. Um, this has been a very informative um, uh, and engaging panel discussion and Q and A discussion as well. 
feel free um, to check out our website at AmericanACTRI.org for future webinars um, and research around these topics. Um, and we thank you all. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you to all of our supporters and our board. Um, thank you so much. And this brings our discussion to an end today. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.